Hello, Googleization Nation, and welcome to Decoding HR Tech, a GGG Unleashed podcast with Amy Warren of Fama. I'm Ira Wolf. And I'm Jason Cochran. In each of Amy's episodes, we'll reimagine everything you thought you knew about HR tech. Let's begin. Hi, everyone. This is Decoding HR Tech, and I'm Amy Warren. And today I'm here with Nicole Goretti, who is actually the head of content and product marketing here at Fama. Today, we're going to be talking about different technologies that can impact quality of hire. So, Nicole, why don't you take a minute and introduce yourself to everybody? And, you know, we've got a little bit of a celebrity on our staff here at Fama, is also known as Social McColl in the HR space. So please don't forget to tell everyone about that part of your background and the awards that you do. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Garotti. I am, as Amy said, head of content marketing and product marketing here at Fama. And I've spent nearly a decade helping HR tech companies like Fama build up their marketing programs. And in my past, I have also been on Ira's show promoting the most inclusive HR influencer list, which is a nominations based free, completely free list that promotes 300 HR practitioners and influencers doing the great work in an effort to diversify voices of influence within the HR and talent acquisition communities. And now I'm on Amy's team and love talking about all ways that talent acquisition and HR can reduce workplace misconduct and improve quality of hire through online screening. First of all, yeah, I, I love the fact that McCall agreed to come on board here at Fama. Love having her as a part of the team and leveraging her great experience. And McCall really does have an incredible understanding of what's going on in the world of HR tech, the vendors that are out there, and how to best use those vendors and those tools in terms of what you're doing for your recruiting efforts and also how to impact quality of hire. And she just recently put out a blog post that will have the link to that in this in the post for this podcast on seven talent acquisition technology solutions to assess quality of hire, plus the pros and cons of each. We only have about 10 minutes to go over some of this. So we're going to go over this at a high level, but I want to really encourage everyone to take a look at the blog post and take a look at the tools that are in here because If you aren't using some of these, it may be a good opportunity for you to educate yourself about them, learn about them, especially as you're starting to budget. We're almost at that time right now to budget for next year. So, McCall, I was looking through this and I think we should just go like one by one really quick and name what each of them are. And then I want to get your sort of quick reaction to them of like, almost like an Andy Cohen, like, you know, watch what happens live. Of, okay, this one, what do you think about it really quick? This one, what do you think about it really quick? <laughs> so go ahead and go through the list of what they are really quick, like list them off. And then I'm going to go back through them one by one. And then I want you to give me really quick the pro and the con. Yeah, so the seven technologies that are really helpful for quality of hire include video interviewing, pre-hire assessments, job simulations, background checks, reference checks, drug testing, and online screening. Very cool. So now video interviews. Give me the pro, give me the con. Yeah, so the pros are you can do them anywhere at any time. They're really, really convenient. The cons is that some of the time, like when it's done on demand, it can be a really dehumanizing experience. And it's also really easy to fake with deep deep fakes now. And today's candidates are really tech savvy. So pro and con. And what would you say when it comes to video things in terms of the use case, which types of industries and businesses are video interviews best used for? Yeah. So a lot of them are used for, I mean, really they, today they can be used for anything in the past. It was really about um, like high volume hiring. So recruiting, hospitality, just where you have a lot of candidates you need to screen that you don't really want to spend time on. But again, it's dehumanizing. And today they're being used a lot more. I mean, COVID 
going, everybody going remote, everybody shutting down in-person operations really sparked the advancement of an increased adoption in the industry significantly. So today they're pretty much used for everything. So pre-hire assessments, pro and con. Depending on the assessment, they can be valid or not valid. You need to make sure that it's the one that you're using is science-backed. So that can be a pro or a con. Typically, they do extend the time to hire. Candidates don't love taking them. And I think I saw somewhere that like 60% of companies said that their pre-hire assessments are taking like 45 minutes, which is ridiculous for candidates to have to go through in today's job market. And I think that stat came from um, Madeline Lorano and Kyle Lagunas's recruiting report. So definitely check that out too. Job simulations, pro, con. Yeah. So this is a new one. So the con is that they're not really well adopted. They're not really well used yet. That could change though. They're really interesting and they provide a really unique experience in terms of like a perspective on how a candidate would handle a specific situation. Another area of that could be a con is that it's they're really limited in scope. So you would only get insights from the candidate and what they're being tested on in terms of like what the experience they go through. So that's kind of the pro and con for job simulations. But it'll be interesting to see that area moving forward in the future. Yeah, especially too with VR technology. We have been talking about that a lot. Like I think that job simulations could take on like a totally different dynamic when you add like the whole entire application of VR. I think that that is the direction it's going. And I think that the adoption levels of VR will determine the adoption levels of job simulations. You know what? I I think that that's actually, I think spot on. I, I think that those two trends probably have a good correlation with each other. Okay. Number four, background checks. Yeah. So background checks are really good to verify identity, verify whether people are saying the things that they're, they've actually done. So if they said that they have a degree from X university, do they actually have that degree? But it's really good for identity and credentialing verifications. The downside is that The background checks often only pick up things that one you're looking for specifically in the background check. So they won't pull up things that you don't pay for. They also have downsides in terms of they will only pick up like if let's just say it's a crim check, criminal background check, they will only pick up things that were picked up on in and recorded in the criminal justice system. So because the criminal justice system may have biases, the criminal background check will pick up biases from the criminal justice system. So those are kinds of the pros and cons of that. Okay. Drug testing, pro con. Yeah. Drug testing. Nobody likes to do them and they've been decreasing in adoption for years now. But the interesting thing is substance abuse costs companies $81 billion a year. So, you know, there might be calls to, to bring them back at some point. And I also think, too, when I think of drug tests, it's like, what drugs are you also testing for? Because the legalization of marijuana changes things a lot. So number six, reference tracks, pro, con. I'm really interested to hear about this because I feel like this is becoming old school. It's like the newest thing that people aren't doing anymore. Yeah. So reference checks are a really, like, like you said, like they're a really interesting space in the past. It was really, really manual and took forever. And I feel like background checks almost with like the verification status of background checks might be like have contributed to the overtaking of reference checks at the same time, like reference checks people will usually only provide references of for people that they know will say good things. So it kind of calls into question whether they're authentic or not. I also feel like too, LinkedIn recommendations that people have written and that are public on LinkedIn kind of fit the bill. And it's one of those sort of, not necessarily an unintended consequence, but it's just this use of LinkedIn that I don't know if they ever really felt like would be such a critical tool. But I know if I'm hiring somebody, I'm looking at LinkedIn recommendations and I would probably take something that's posted somewhere publicly, even over something that someone has with me in a private conversation that's positive. That's really interesting because I wonder if my wheels are turning about like whether somebody would be more likely to say something bad in a reference check because it's private. But I feel like that doesn't actually happen. That just calls into question the validity of reference checks even more. Okay. So that was number six. All right. Number seven, our final one, online screening solutions, pro con. Yeah. So online screening solutions are great because I think I saw a stat that like 
75% of hiring managers are Googling and friending candidates on like Facebook and like Instagram and like Twitter and stuff like that to like learn more about them specifically to find out information like that's protected class information that they aren't supposed to be using. And so online screening can be that compliance check for organizations to say, no, 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 that's not compliance. Like, you know, online screening can tell you the things that you want to know about your candidates, specifically related to, are they engaging in workplace misconduct issues? And that's without revealing protected class information that does lead to those, the bias in the hiring practice, this discrimination lawsuits and other issues that come up with candidates in the hiring process. Online screening solutions like third party vendors are compliant and they're a great way to kind of again, halt that non-compliance that recruiters are seeing in hiring managers. The downside is, again, similar. They work similar to a background check. So, I mean, they'll only catch things that you're looking for, but that just means that you need to look for the right things, like with any part of the hiring process. Yeah. And I would say, obviously, full disclosure that Fauna is an online screening provider. And I think the only thing that I would add to the pro and the con is on The pro side, I think I would add that if you're using online screening, when you've gotten down to your final three candidates and you find something that pops, like someone has harassed someone publicly online or defamed somebody or is making disparaging comments, maybe even about your own company, that candidate that may have been number one out of your final three may not be a candidate that you're even going to consider making an offer to. So you know, I always find that to be interesting as a pro, as a fairly quick and inexpensive way to get a read on somebody for quality in terms of misconduct. And then I would say one of the cons is you can't find everything out. No one can find everything out. And I think that kind of leads into just the overall challenge with quality of hire to begin with that I think about what was the stat that you had on fraud? How much fraud costs employers oh, a year? Occupational fraud costs 5% of annual revenues. Globally, that's almost $4 trillion a year. So like this whole concept of quality of hire and trying to figure out who are the people that aren't going to commit fraud? How can we like impact revenue? Who are the people that are not going to come in and harass other employees because it, right now, it's difficult to hire and retain employees. The last thing that you want to do is spend all this time and effort to hire somebody only to find out that they engage in misconduct shortly after being hired that then impacts the rest of the team. So right. it's those challenges. And your list, it's a great list, but there's not a lot of tools out there. There's not a lot of ways to get at this at all. And yet it's such an important metric to do. Is there anything that you've seen outside of these seven things that you would also say like, Hey, this is an innovative practice to do. I know there's some things in fraud that don't even require tools. So if you implement like these one or two practices, you can actually potentially recognize fraud that's going on in organization. Yeah. So this actually isn't a technology, but Forcing employees to take PTO, like having a solid PTO policy and requiring employees to actually take the PTO is actually like a great way to catch things like embezzlement because a lot of like financial crimes, specifically fraud, embezzlement, they require constant attention. And so a lot of financial service institutions actually require employees specifically to take PTO so that they can catch anything that's going on while the employees are out of the office. So that is a really big way. Another great way to do that is to have diversified interview panels. So if you have a a cross-functional team of women, people of color, actively interviewing candidates, that's another way to just kind of get a gut check. Like, does this candidate or do these groups of candidates treat every single one of your interviewers with respect? Do they keep the conversation in a a job relevant way that it's supposed to be? Or are they making your interviewers feel uncomfortable and saying things that are really inappropriate to some of them? That can kind of reveal a lot of quality of hire issues as well with candidates. 
So, you know, one of the things like, I always want to do is I don't want, I don't want everyone to be like, dive into some of this tech, take a look at the blog post. Nicole's got references to some of the other companies that support some of these tools and things and look at them. And maybe there's one in there that works for you that me that you can implement. You've got a little bit of extra budget for next year. And we all know quality of hire is important. And maybe this is the place that you want to invest a little bit of dollars and see how it impacts you next year. So I strongly recommend doing that. And then these things that you can implement without having to have a tool that are just more policy issues, always on board for those things to improve the process that you have. And, you know, we've got two challenges right now, Nicole. If we were in person, right, I would love to do a shot ski. I also don't have a shot ski. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, where I would also love to end this on uh, Andy Cohen watch what happens live moment with a shot ski. Um, I think we're probably just going to have to end it with a wave. <laughs> but I, yeah, I just have <laughs> one more thing to the episode before we, Absolutely. before we sign off. Okay. So I want to make clear that there is a, like when we're talking about specifically quality of hire, it is important to think about that through multiple lenses. So a lot of times quality of hires really just focus on, does this person have the skills to do this job? But if they're coming in and stealing from the company or making other employees or clients feel uncomfortable, so they want to leave, like that doesn't make for a good hire. That makes for somebody that maybe needs some talking tos by HR. But again, like that's not somebody that you want to just bring into your workforce and have to do. So quality of hire really does mean like they come into the team, they can do the job, of course, that's like the bare minimum. But do they also add value? Do they also uplift our peers? Do they also come in and make the organization as a whole a better place and contribute more value than they're taking away? So like that's just that's something to think about, too. Yeah, I would totally agree. And I would also just add at the end of this that, you know, you also want to have fun in your workplace. Right. Yeah. And you want to be able to bring people on that are going to contribute in more ways than one, which is the adding the value. So this is why I'll say this too. I enjoy so much having McCall as a member of my team because we get to do fun things like this. We get to really work, but that it also doesn't feel like work when we can pretend to do shot skis. <laughs> <laughs> So on that note, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is Decoding HR Tech. I'm Amy Warren, and I'm looking forward to everyone listening next time. Thanks so much. That's it for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in and learning about the future of HR Tech. We'll be back next month with Amy for another episode. But until then, please check out Fama's website at fama.io. That's F-A-M-A -A dot I-O. Until next time, don't let the shift hit your plans.